A reading from the book of Revelation. This is from chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. The word of the Lord. Hey everyone. I just want to say a special welcome to our kids because I know you guys are on school holidays at the moment. And I just want to say to you, make sure you listen in because I've put a few things in this message for you. And if I haven't met you before and you're listening right now, I'm Ben, I'm part of the staff team, and uh, I'm just really excited to open up Revelation chapter 5 with you today. And the reason that I'm excited is because the message of hope that it gave to the seven churches in Revelation is just as relevant for us today. Because the seven churches in Revelation, they were living in a time of chaos and trouble. And we too today, we live in a time of difficulty and chaos and trouble, don't we? I mean, on a global scale. At the beginning of the year in Australia, we saw the bushfires. And then we saw COVID come into play and take us away from our family, our friends, our schools. We've seen racial injustice spotlighted and all the protests that have been going on. I mean, Adam said two weeks ago, and I think it was pretty accurate. It feels like someone has gotten hold of our world and is just shaking it. And I don't know if if you resonate with that at all. But if you feel saddened about what's happening... If you feel confused or anxious or just sick of it and you just want peace, you just want hope, then you are going to want to hear what God is saying through Revelation chapter 5. Because something happens in this chapter that changes weeping into exuberant joy. 
Something happens that makes hope more real than hopelessness, that makes joy more appropriate than sorrow. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But before we do, let me just tell you a little bit about the book of Revelation itself. The book of Revelation, it comes at the very end of the Bible, and it comes with all sorts of different reactions from Christians and people who aren't Christian as well. Um, Some Christians are intimidated by it. They think it's just all these symbols and things going on, like how can I possibly understand this book? Some Christians are fascinated, even obsessed by it, and, and they wish that we could speak about this every single week. And if you're not a Christian, you probably think it's just downright weird when you read about all the dragons and visions and and heavenly realities that are going on in the book. And I I think that the reason that we have some of these different reactions to it is because we don't actually understand the style of this book. This book was written in a particular style that the ancient world knew about, and it's called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. So we have styles that we write in today. We've got comics that we write. We've got poetry. We've got comedy. In the ancient world, one of their common styles of writing was apocalyptic. And apocalyptic was filled with with symbols and images that the culture knew about. And it really created a powerful message for the people in that day. And so part of what we have to do in Revelation is try and understand how the ancient audience would have understood these symbols so that we can understand what it's getting at. Let me just explain that to you with an illustration. So if someone hands you a newspaper, you've got this big paper, it says the Herald at the top or something like that, you know it's going to tell you about news. Hopefully it's going to tell you about facts. Now, if you read the newspaper, not as news, but as comedy, you're going to run into problems. If the headline says, government is warning all citizens to stay indoors due to dangerous weather, and you read that like comedy, like it's a joke, you're going to run into trouble. And it's the same thing with Revelation. We're going to get it muddled up unless we read it as apocalyptic writing. Let me just take that example a little bit further. We also know that with a newspaper that they often have a local audience. So if the newspaper is written in Brazil, we know it's written to Brazilian people. Now, if we take a Brazilian newspaper and we read it here in Australia as if it's written for our context, we're also going to run into problems. And it's the same thing with Revelation. The book actually had an immediate audience. In Revelation 1 verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. In fact, John, who was on the island of Patmos, you can still go and visit that island, it's part of Greece today. Um, He was there and he was told to send what he would write down to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, these are real places in the ancient world. And in fact, what's really interesting is the order that that it's given in there in verse 11 is actually the order that a messenger probably would have carried John's letter to the churches. So look at the picture on the screen and you can see that the messenger would have taken the letter from Patmos first across the sea to Ephesus and then they would have traveled up to Pergamum and then come back down and ending at Laodicea, kind of like a horseshoe. That was a common trade route in the ancient world. This book was written to real churches, real places, real people in the first century in the ancient world. So just like we need to understand that a newspaper from Brazil should make sense to Brazilians, we should understand that Revelation is going to make a lot of sense to the people it was first written to. They didn't know about Australia, America, Russia or Donald Trump yet. This was an ancient letter written in an ancient world. So while the message of Revelation 5 does have relevance for us today, we do need to do the hard work of understanding how the symbols in it would have been understood by the original audience. And as it turns out, most of the symbols in Revelation 5 come from the Old Testament. Now we're going to see that in a second because we're going to open up Revelation 5 now. And in the opening scene, um, there is a serious issue in heaven. John is weeping. He is absolutely hopeless. He's weeping. He's crying. And we're going to ask, what exactly was the problem? Why was he so upset? So let's open up this first section and look at an issue worth 
weeping over. An issue worth weeping over. Let's read the first few verses together. John says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Okay, so what's going on here? What does this scroll represent? What does it mean? Well, let's have a look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where it says, Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll. Okay, notice the similarities between these verses and Revelation 5. In this hand was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it, were written words of lament and mourning and woe. So remember how I said that apocalyptic writings would draw on symbols that the audience knew about? Well, it seems like Revelation 5 is actually just drawing on an image from Ezekiel 2. Inside the scroll given to Ezekiel are words of lament and mourning and woe. So too, the scroll in Revelation 5 represents judgment. And you only need to, revelate, to read Revelation 6 to figure that much out. But why is John so unhappy about that? Why is he so unhappy that this scroll of judgment can't be opened? Well, one scholar answers it like this. They say, He weeps because its contents, the events that will end human history and the reign of evil, cannot take place. You see, judgment might not sound good to us, But it's only through judgment that the wrongs in this world will be put right. Think about it this way. If there is a criminal criminal who intentionally murders an innocent person and, and they've been given a court date, a trial for a judgment to be offered, but this trial just keeps getting put back again and again and again and again. Now that might be good news for the criminal, but that's terrible news for the victim's family. They want this wrong to be called out for what it is. They want this to be put right. And that's a little bit of how John was feeling when he was weeping over the fact that the scroll couldn't be opened. Many of us want to live in a world where judgment doesn't need to exist. But bad deeds, evil deeds, don't vanish into thin air. They cost something. The death of George Floyd costs something. The lives taken by ISIS cost something. The abduction and murder of Daniel Morkham cost something. We need justice. If you want to preach love without any form of justice, you are preaching bad news to the countless victims of this broken and evil world. You're preaching good news to the privileged and to the comfortable, But you're preaching bad news to the downtrodden. You're preaching bad news to victims of racial injustice, to families who have lost children, to the victims of terrorism. Our world needs justice. Kids, let me explain it this way. Imagine there is a a bully at your school. They're really mean to you and, and to the other kids in the class. And they do a lot of horrible things. And so you decide that you want to tell the teacher and point this out. But every time you point this out, the bully acts like the perfect student. They act all good and nice and kind and they just never get in trouble by the teacher. I mean, not only would that be frustrating, but it would be so frustrating that it might be enough to make you cry. It's just not right. It's just not fair. Well, John is crying and weeping because the scroll contain God's plan to put our world right. But no one could open it. John wanted to see the day when God would bring a new world full of love and joy and peace. But the problem was, no one was worthy to open the scroll in God's hand. 
No one was able to take it and bring painful human history to its end. No wonder John was weeping. So I guess the question is, is there someone worthy? Is there someone, anyone, who can be trusted to put our world right, who can take the scroll from God's hand and do the right thing? Well, let's keep on reading, and we're going to find out the answer to this question in the next few verses. And this section is called, Is There Anyone Worthy? Is there anyone worthy? Read verse 5 with me. John says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Who is this lion of Judah? Who is this root of David? Well, these two pictures also come from the Old Testament, from Genesis 49 and Isaiah 11. And these promises in those passages tell us about a ruler, about a king who would come and save God's people, about a ruler who would set up a kingdom, a world, a system of of righteousness and peace and joy. And the claim throughout the entire New Testament is that this person is Jesus. Jesus has triumphed. He alone is able to take the scroll and open it with its seven seals. So John can stop weeping because Jesus has secured complete victory. But I guess the question is, how did he do this? How did Jesus triumph? How can we be so sure that victory really is his? Well, let's keep reading. Let's read the next verse. Verse 6. John says, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. So John looks and He sees the lamb. What's this all about? How does a slaughtered lamb um, connote victory? How does a slaughtered lamb tell us about victory? Well, the answer lies in the cross and the resurrection. Jesus secured total victory through his death at the cross and his resurrection from the grave. That's why he's pictured as a lamb that's alive, even though it looks like it's been slaughtered. Because Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, but then he rose again, and now he's alive. Jesus is the conquering lion of Judah, but he didn't conquer our enemies through strength and power. He conquered through suffering and death. Jesus is the lamb who was slain for you and for me. And that reveals an important truth to us. It shows us that it's not just the bullies of this world who deserve judgment, but it's us as well. In Romans, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, we are not only victims in need of rescue, but we're perpetrators of evil that deserve judgment. Jesus' death and resurrection deals with both those issues. He destroys the accusations that Satan rightly had against us and defeats the power of evil by taking our judgment in our place at the cross. In his death and resurrection, Jesus won victory over evil and he secured forgiveness for sinners who have participated in evil. And he did this all at the cost of his own life. That's why Jesus alone is worthy to take the scroll. And that's why they sang a new song saying, You, Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and people and nation. Jesus paid the ultimate price. He gave up his life. He shed his own blood to release us from our great debt to God and to make us God's people. You see, the cross of Jesus solves two big problems. On the one hand, we owe God an infinite debt because of our sin. That's what Satan rightly had against us as well. He could accuse us because of that. 
And when we lie or we cheat or we fight or we hurt other people, we don't just sin against others, we sin against God. And it's kind of like we're racking up this debt, this debt that we could never repay. And God being totally just and righteous, he has to balance the books. He has to do justice. I mean, we want him to judge evil. We want him to put the world right. But the scary thing is, is that we deserve to be caught up in that judgment. That's the first problem. We're sinners and God is just. The second tension is that God is merciful. He loves mercy. He wants to save his people from the mess they've gotten themselves into. So, so how did God hold his justice and his mercy together? How did God condemn evil, but yet save sinners who participated in that evil? Well, the answer lies in the cross, in the death of Jesus and his resurrection from the grave. Kids, I want to explain this to you by telling you a, a story, an example. Imagine you did something really wrong. Imagine a teacher told you, hey, you're not allowed to go and kick this ball in that car park, all right? Okay, make sure you kick it on the sports oval or something like that. And you decide, oh, who cares what they say? You go into the car park, you kick it, and you end up breaking the teacher's car window, all right? You run off, you hope no one will know about it. But later on in class, one of the other students gets up and they actually saw you did this and they say in front of the class that you broke this teacher's car window. Now what is the teacher going to do? Well this teacher loves you but they can't just say that it's okay. They have to set an example. They have to keep the rules. So they come up to the front of the classroom and they say yes what you did was wrong and you will have to pay the money to repair it. So your heart just sinks. You think, how am I ever going to have enough money to pay for this window? But then after class, the teacher comes up to you and they give you the money that you need in cash. What just happened? Well, the teacher was both fair and kind. They were fair. They said what you did was wrong because it was wrong. But they were kind because they paid the penalty for you. They paid the price for you. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He didn't say our evil didn't matter. He didn't say, who cares? He said, it is wrong. But he came from heaven to earth to pay the price that we needed to pay. He gave up his own life. This is why he alone is worthy to take the scroll. So he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat in the throne. And I love how James Hamilton Jr. describes this moment. He says, Jesus takes the scroll that describes the events of the end, whereby all the wrongs will be set right, all injustices accounted for, all crimes avenged. He takes it from the right hand of the Father, and the Father doesn't resist him. The four living creatures don't object, and the 24 elders do not stand in his way. This symbolic action shows that Jesus has taken control of history. He is King. He is Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and He has taken the scroll. Jesus controls your destiny. He controls the destiny of every individual on this planet. You see, when Jesus first came into this world, He came in weakness and humility. He came to seek and save the lost. But when Jesus returns, He will take the scroll from the right hand of the Father, And he will come in blazing glory. He will come in power and authority and he will do what is right. He will do justice throughout the earth. He will destroy greed and poverty. He will overthrow terrorism. He will judge Satan, that liar and accuser. He will banish death. He will remove everything in this world that breaks our hearts and makes us want to cry. Jesus will do justice. And that's good news. But obviously that's scary news for those of us who have not repented for the part we have played in evil and put our faith in God. John 3 verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son, in Jesus, has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, 
for God's wrath remains on them. I want to call on you today. If you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, if you have not yet called him your king, your Lord, if you have not yet thanked him for what he did on the cross, I want to call on you to come to him. He is gracious. He is loving. He is kind. In John 6 verse 37, he says, Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, or what you've done. If you will come to Jesus, he will not turn you away. So I just want to encourage you to come to him, to put your faith in him, to say sorry for the things that you've done, and to say, would you forgive me? And he would so love to do that. And if you do do that, you will not only be accepted in loving embrace, but you will be assured that one day you will look upon a world that no longer groans under injustice and cruelty and violence because that is the future of God's people. In fact, in Revelation chapter 7, after the seals and the scroll have been opened by Jesus, it says this about God's people. It says, They are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus will put our world right. And his death and resurrection are a foretaste and a guarantee of the victory that is to come. So church, do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. That's good news. Knowing this changes everything. It means hope is more real than hopelessness. It means joy is appropriate even in sorrow. And in fact, there is only one response that is worthy of Jesus. There is only one response that we should give to him once we've learned this. And we're going to look at that response in the final section of our chapter. The only worthy response. The only worthy response. And we're showing what this is in verses 8 to 14. Let me read it for us. So after Jesus has taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. You, Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. What an amazing scene. Kids, I want you to imagine this with me for a moment. Imagine that you were there with John. And you see these these living creatures and these elders create a whole new song just to worship Jesus, just to praise him. And then you look again and you see the whole world, all the animals, all the people, creatures you've never even heard of before, praising God, praising Jesus for what he has done. You see, at the beginning of our chapter, 
John was on the ground weeping. He was hopeless. But by the end of the chapter, all of creation is worshipping and praising Jesus because he gave his life for you and for me. And he will one day end all the sadness and the pain in our world. You see, kids, you might think that theme parks or, or video games or new toys are exciting. But the Bible shows us that there is nothing more exciting than Jesus and what he has done for us. He is worthy of our time and our enjoyment and our attention. He is worthy. And you know, we will experience pain. We'll experience difficulty in this world, whether it's bullying or racism or a pandemic. But we do not need to weep hopelessly because Jesus has conquered and he will one day put our world right. So our response right now is just to worship him. If your faith is in Jesus, no matter how real your pain or your difficulty is right now, the victory of Jesus is even more real. And one day you will dance for joy when you see Jesus conquer all the things that make you sad and feel hopeless in this world. Jesus deserves our worship. Jesus deserves our praise. Our future is incredibly bright because of what he has done. So we're going to spend some time, church, just worshiping him and praising him together just right now. But before we do that, I'd love to pray with you. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are worthy of all the honor, all the power, all the glory, all the praise and the wisdom and the strength. Jesus, lead us to worship you. Help us to take hold of Revelation 5 and its message for us today. It's a true message. You are the lion and the lamb. <laughs> you are the victor and the conqueror. And you are the humble one who gave your life for people who didn't deserve it. You are love. You are gracious. You are kind. And Lord, we look forward to that day, to a new world filled with your justice and your love and peace and kindness of joy and fun and dancing and clapping. Lord, we pray that we would never lose sight of this future. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in you. And we pray that we can just enjoy worshiping you together now. And we pray this by the glorious and the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, just before we praise, let me just uh, read this blessing over you from Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. It says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.